God of Truth Ministries, bringing you the truth of God's Word, void of the doctrines of men. The simple message of truth, and the truth will set you free. Now, bringing today's message, I present to you, Pastor Kenneth Knotts. Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Kenneth Knotts. I'm Pastor Knotts here at the Church at the Gate Beautiful. Uh, this is our Bible study lesson for this week. Um, we are going to go ahead and go over repentance. Repentance is, is important. This is part of something that we started a few weeks ago uh, with the true salvation message, which is not the salvation message that is being taught today. Today's message says that repentance is not necessary. It's not a requirement, but the Bible definitely teaches. The Bible definitely teaches that repentance is a requirement of salvation. And this lesson, uh, when we're finished with it, is going to be probably at least two parts um, that we want people to be able to see that repentance is required, what repentance is, and how we get repentance in our life. Uh, now, um, today I am here at the church doing this, doing this Bible study. Normally, I'm going to be doing the Bible studies from the shack, which is up in Orla, Texas. I work as a truck driver for uh, the post office, and I have a layover in Orla, Texas. There, I call it the shack. And I'll be doing a lot of the Bible studies from the shack. Um, but today, I, I, was, I had time, I actually had a day off where I was able to come down, and I'm doing these uh, videos for the Bible study, and I'm going to do some work here at the church as well when I'm finished. So... Um, don't forget to give us a thumbs up and subscribe to us uh, so that you don't miss out on any of our Bible studies later on. All right, so uh, repentance. What is repentance? Repentance in the Old Testament is the word, the, Greek, the Hebrew word, shub, which means to turn back or retreat. Its focus is on the outward uh, expression of repentance. It, it focuses on the outward, and you need to remember this because with, with these two types, of re, these two words for repentance, uh, it, it, one's an inner and one's an outer. In the Hebrew, which is typical of the Hebrews, they uh, focused on the, the fruit of everything. They, they 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 focused on your works, and that's how we got the position where the scribes and the Pharisees were when Jesus had come. They were all about the works. Were inside. They were just dirty, nasty. The apostle John, or not the apostle, but John the baptizer, called them vipers and snakes uh, because inwardly they they were detestable. They were dirty and filthy. But on the outside, uh, Jesus called them whitewashed tombs. They were painted up all nice and pretty on the outside. They looked so spiritual, and uh, this, so the the Hebrews have definitely spent a lifetime. Uh, looking on the outward appearance rather than on the inward. But in the Hebrew, the word repentance is the word shub, which is to mean to turn back or retreat, to change the way you live your life. That is the meaning of the Hebrew word shub, which is re for repentance. Okay, where do we see the teaching of repentance uh, in the Word of God? The, it, well, the word of repentance has been, the, the teaching of repentance has come from uh, the very beginning, all through the Bible, all the way to the end, repentance is screamed repeatedly and repeatedly and repeatedly. Because without repentance, I can assure you, without repentance, you do not have salvation. It's just that simple. And I will show you during these lessons that uh what repentance is, and that without a doubt, without repentance, you don't have salvation. So let's look at some of the first teachings. This is not the first teaching. This is just one of the teachings of uh, repentance. I would not have time to do all of them. Okay, this is coming from the, pop, pop, the prophets of the Old Testament. It's going to be Ezekiel 18, Ezekiel chapter 18, verses 30 through 32. Ezekiel chapter 18, verses 30 through 32. And it says, Therefore I will judge you, O house of Israel, every one according to his ways, says the Lord. Okay, when it says ways, that, that's works. He's, he's going to judge you by what you do. Okay, he says, Therefore I will judge you, O house of Israel, every one according to what you do, saith the Lord God. 
repent and turn yourselves from your transgressions. Transgressions meaning moral or religious rebellion, sin, okay? So iniquity, perversity, or also known as sin, shall not be your ruin. So let's read that again, verse 30. For I will judge you, O house of Israel, everyone according to what he does, says the Lord God. Repent and turn yourself from your sin so that your iniquity or your perversity shall not be your ruin. All right, verse 31. Cast away from you all your transgressions. Cast away from you all your transgressions. That would be your sin. That would be your works of rebellion. Uh, he wants those cast away. Whereby ye have transgressed and make you a new heart and a new spirit. For why shall ye die, O house of Israel? For I have no pleasure in the death of him that dieth, says the Lord God. Wherefore, turn yourselves and live. Okay, so what is the prophet Ezekiel repeating what God told him? Uh, he's telling the people of Israel, repent from your ways. Turn from your evil ways. Stop being rebellious towards, for, towards God. All right? And if you stop and you, you, you get rid of your transgressions, and what, what did he say? Uh, Cast away your transgressions uh, by which ye have transgressed. He said, get, cast them, get them away from you. Pick them up like uh, a hot potato and throw them away from you. Uh, that cast your transgressions, cast your rebellion far from you, because God doesn't have any pleasure in him that dieth. Therefore, turn yourself and live. Okay, so this is a very great example uh, of repentance of what we're supposed to do. Okay, he wants us to stop living in rebellion, to stop sinning, to stop living in our perversity, because our perversity will be our ruin. All right, this is what he's telling us that we are supposed to cast away, throw away far from us our, trans our transgressions and make ourselves a new heart. He says, For why will ye die, O house of Israel? We'll die if we don't repent. Exactly what he's saying. For I have no pleasure in the death of him that dieth, saith the Lord God. Therefore turn yourselves, the meaning of the word shub, to turn away or retreat, all right? Turn yourselves and live. In other words, repent and live. Don't repent and die. He doesn't find pleasure in you dying, but if you don't repent, you're going to die. Let's, we all know the story of Jonah. Jonah was told by God to go to the city of Nineveh. Jonah didn't like the people in the city, city of Nineveh. Jonah wanted to see the people of Nineveh die. He wanted to see God destroy the people of Nineveh because he didn't like them. He didn't like what they did. Apparently there was some uh, back history with him. Okay, But the word of the Lord, okay, Jonah 3, we're going to start with verse 1. Jonah chapter 3, and uh, we see that uh, Jonah didn't go the first time. He ran away. God had him swallowed up by a big fish. Jonah repented in the belly of the fish. God had the fish spit him up on the beach. He went back home. God told him again the second time. And the word of the Lord, verse 1, chapter 3, verse 1, and the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time, saying, Arise, go unto Nineveh, that great city, and preach unto it the preaching that I bid thee. So Jonah arose and went to Nineveh according to the word of the Lord, now, Nineveh was an exceedingly great city of a three days journey. So with his walking, he's going to be a three days journey to get to Nineveh from where he was at. All right. And Jonah began to enter the city on a day's journey. All right. So apparently he walked pretty fast uh, and it was a pretty big city. So um, So I believe what that's actually saying is it's not, I, I apologize, I, I said that wrong. Uh, to journey from one side of the city to the other side of the city, I believe is what they're saying. It's a three days journey to get from one side of the city to the other. So uh, Jonah went to Nineveh. He went into the city on a one day's journey. So he's not quite in the middle of the city, but he got a day's journey into the city 
And he cried out and said, this is verse 4, And Jonah began to enter the city a day's journey. And he cried and said, Yet forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. So the people of Nineveh, Nineveh believed God and proclaimed a fast and put on sackcloth from the greatest of them to even the least of them. For the word came from the king of Nineveh, and he arose from his throne, and he laid his robe from him and covered him with sackcloth and sat in ashes. And he caused it to be proclaimed and published throughout Nineveh by the decree of the king and his nobles, saying, let neither man nor beast nor flock taste of anything. Let them not feed nor drink water. Okay, so what do we see here? Uh, Jonah came into the city, said in 40 days, uh, Nineveh will be overturned. The people of Nineveh believed what Jonah was saying. They believed the word of God. What is uh, belief? Belief is the inward part of um, the inward part. Of re or, excuse me, of repentance, okay? The shub is the outward works of, okay? So we see both the inward um, and we both also see the outward. I'll go ahead and just kind of give you a heads up. I'm, I'm jumping ahead here, but I kind of should have let you know this before. In the New Testament, the Greek word for repentance is metaneo. Metaneo, which means to change how you think, all right? Metaneo means to change how you think. So, okay, so Jonah arose to uh, Nineveh, went in a day's journey, and he started preaching to them, saying, Yet in 40 days, Nineveh shall be overthrown. Nineveh is going to be conquered. You guys are going to be overthrown in 40 days. So the people of Nineveh believed God, okay? So it started, Jonah brought the seed, all right? He brought the seed of God's word into the people it was planted it started to grow and they believed god they had uh metaneo uh re repentance the inward the change of the way you think the change of your heart all right then they proclaimed a fast they put on sackcloth from the greatest of them to the least of them so not only did they change how they thought that that change of thought caused them to change the way they lived. So they, they, they uh, proclaimed a fast. This is the fruit of their metaneo. This is the fruit of their repentance. All right. Everybody understand that. Okay, so let's go to verse 7. I'm sorry, verse 6. For the word came unto the king of Nineveh, and he arose from his throne, and he laid his robe from him, and covered him with sackcloth, and sat in ashes. And he caused it to be proclaimed and published throughout Nineveh by the decree of the king, that his noble saying, Let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock, taste of anything. Let them not feed nor drink water. Verse 8. Let man and beast be covered with sackcloth, and cry mightily unto God. Yea, let them turn every one from his evil way and from the violence that is in their hands. Okay, so we see here the king of Nineveh uh, proclaiming a, a change in, in the way a, a change in the way they act, a change in the way they live, a reformation in life. And we're going to get into this here a little bit later. But we see that there was a seed planted of the word of God. It changed how they thought. Now they're in the fruit of repentance, which is the works of repentance, that they're uh, fasting, they got put on sackcloth, they're rubbing ashes on themselves, and even to the much as the king of Nineveh made a proclamation that this was everybody in the in the king or in the city of Nineveh was going to do this by law of the king. And it continues verse nine Who can tell if God will turn and repent? Now this word repent is the word Naham, which means to be sorry in a favorable sense or to have pity. Oh, so the king of Nineveh is saying, who can tell if God's going to have pity on us or not and turn away from his fierce anger that we perish not? Now, or verse 10, and God saw, what did he see? He saw their works, the works of their repentance, that they had turned from their evil way, and God repented. That's again the Nah Naham. Uh, he uh, repented 
uh, he had pity on them from their evil ways, that he had said that he would do unto them, and he did it not. So God said that he was going to kill them, he was going to overthrow them, he was going to wipe their city out uh, if they didn't repent. They had the inward change from the seed of the word of God. That was from Jonah. Uh, the word of God was proclaimed to them. That seed grew, turned into repentance, changed their mind, how they think. All right. And from that, they had fruit of repentance, which is they changed their actions, which was the works of their repentance. Now we see that with faith, the works of our faith is the perfection or the completion of our faith. And I'm going to say that the works of our repentance is the perfection or the completion of our repentance. Okay, let's go ahead and turn to Jeremiah chapter 4. Jeremiah chapter 4, verses 1 through 4. And uh, we'll start reading verses 1. If thou wilt return, O Israel, says the Lord, return unto me, and if thou wilt put away the, thy abominations, that is the disgusting, filthy, especially I mean, talking about idolatry and despisable things. So God's telling them to put away these disgusting, filthy, idolatrous things, uh, to put them out of his sight. Uh, then shall thou not be removed. Verse 2, And thou shalt swear, the Lord liveth in truth, in judgment, and in righteousness, and the nations shall bless themselves in him, and in him shall they glorify that him is our Lord God. All right. So God is saying, telling the people of Israel that they need to turn away from their disgusting, filthy ways and, and, and get to cast them out of his sight. He doesn't want to see them anymore. And he says he will not, he will not remove them. All right. So let's go look at verse 3. For thus says the Lord to the man of Judah and Jerusalem, break up your feral ground, and sow not among the thorns. Circumcise yourself to the Lord, and take away the foreskin of your heart, that men of Judah, ye men of Judah, and the inhabitants of Jerusalem, yes, let lest my fury come forth like fire, and burn that none can quench it, because the evil of your doings. All right, because of the evil of your doings. So God is saying you need to take your iniquities, you need to take your sins, you need to take your idolatry, your disgusting filth, and you need to get it out of my sight. Get it out of my sight, get it out of your life, and you will not be removed. So he's saying in verse 4, he's basically the circumcision of your heart, uh, which is the sanctification, removing the sin out of your life. You cut that unwanted, that foreskin, that unneeded, unwanted foreskin of your heart, you remove it, and that's the sin, that 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 foreskin is representation of the sin in your life that you cut that and remove that from your life and it says his fury will not come forth like fire and you will live okay so let's go ahead one of the things one of the most probably important prophecies concerning the future of the new covenant was given to us by jeremiah let's again look at jeremiah verse chapter 31 verses 31 through 34 Jeremiah chapter 31, verses 31 through 34. And it says, Behold, the day comes, saith the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant which I made with their fathers. That would be Abraham. And in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, which my covenant they break, although I was a husband to them, saith the Lord. Okay, so God took them by the hand, took them out of Egypt, uh, delivered them from the Egyptians, set them free. He made that covenant with them through Abraham before that, uh, but they uh, broke that covenant. God didn't break it, but they, they broke the covenant. And uh, let's read verse 33. But this shall be the covenant that I make with the house of Israel. After those days, saith the Lord, I will put my law in their inward parts, and write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and I will, and they shall be my people. Okay, so the the Lord God was telling the people the new covenant He's going to make is going to be it's going to be an inward thing rather than an outward thing. Uh, to the the house of Israel, they had the law; they were written on tablets of stone. 
they were written on paper, par physical page, par parchments of paper that they had made. All right, but he's saying it's not going to be written on tablets and it's not going to be written on uh, stone. It's going to be written on their hearts and in their minds. It's going to be on their inward parts. And that's what the work of the Holy Spirit does to us. And yet we have the Bible, which it is written down. It is on parchment paper. But that word, as we read it, uh, as part of the New Covenant, as we read it, it incorporates itself into us. And we have that word inscribed onto our heart, written on our heart. Okay, so who was the last of the Old Testament prophets? I'm glad you asked that, because that was John the Baptizer. John the Baptizer was the last of the Old Testament prophets. And does anybody know what the John the, ba John the Baptizer's uh, message was to people? Uh, Matthew 3, chapter, excuse me, Matthew chapter 3, verses 1 through 8. Actually, we're just going to do 1 through 3. All right, Matthew chapter 3, verses 1 through 3. And it says, In those days came John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, Repent, or repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is he that was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord and make his paths straight. Okay, the Apostle Paul, excuse me, John the Baptist was the forerunner of Jesus Christ. And his job was to come and uh, proclaim the coming of Jesus Christ, who was the promised Messiah. All the Jews were looking for the promised Messiah. They knew that it was going to come someday, but it has still not happened. So John was the forerunner. He was the one to lay, roll out the red carpet, so to speak, for Jesus' coming. And what was his message? Repent. For the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And that word repent is the word metaneo. Okay, so metaneo is the inward, uh, the inward change of how you think. All right, so in the New Testament Greek, the word metaneo is the word for repentance. It means to think differently or to change your mind. And its focus, like I talked about earlier, was on the inward change in us. Okay, so let's look at Matthew 4.17. Matthew 4.17. And it says, From that time Jesus began to preach and to say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. All right, so Jesus' message was repent. Apostle, excuse me, John the Baptist's message was repent. All the prophets of old, their message was repent. The repentance message has not changed. Okay, so what is Jesus, when did Jesus start to teach this? When did he start to pre preach repentance? It was after he was baptized by John the baptizer and the, the Spirit of God came on him like a dove and it remained on him. Uh, so the Spirit of God remained on Jesus throughout his entire ministry. After Jesus had the, uh, the Holy Spirit come on him, that's when he started his ministry after he got out of the wilderness for his uh, 40 days of uh um, fasting and his to be tempted of Satan. Okay, so what is the importance of repentance? Re, uh, repentance uh, apparently must be pretty important considering it was one of the main things that was preached throughout the Word of God. However, today's churches say that repentance isn't even necessary. Uh, I beg to differ, and that is a, a doctrine of, of Satan, that is a doctrine of demons to say that repentance is not part of what we need as Christians in our life. Let's look at Luke 13, 3. Luke chapter 13, verse 3. And this is Jesus uh, speaking here. He says, I tell you, nay, but except ye repent, that's the word metaneo, ye shall all likewise perish. We must all have a, a change in how we think. To think differently, instead of thinking in the ways of the world, we need to think as God would think. We need to change the way we think, all right? What, think about what? How we think about sin, all right? We need to change how we think about sin. We need to repent from sin, and we start that by metaneo, which is we change how we think, all right? We have a new relationship with sin. Basically, what metaneo is, it means we are having a new relationship with sin. Now, we see that 
we get all hung up with our relationship with Jesus and we completely and totally forget about that we need to have a new relationship with sin as well. Our old relationship with sin, we got along just fine. Me and sin, we had a lot of fun together. We went out drinking, we went out carousing, and you know what it ended up being? It ended up being almost destroying my life to where I pretty much lost everything in my life. And I changed the way I thought, and I came back to God. All right, so repentance in the Greek is the word metaneo, which means to think differently, to change how we think on the inside. And Jesus tells us, quite frankly, unless ye repent, ye shall likewise perish. Okay? So Jesus' first message was that of repentance. Repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. Let's look at Acts chapter 17. Acts chapter 17, verse 30. And this says, And in the times of ignorance, God winked. Now, the word wink there means to overlook or to leave unpunished. So basically, God overlooked uh, things in ignorance. He, he overlooked things in ignorance back in the time, back in the day, days of old. But now commandeth all men everywhere to repent. So this is not, uh, repent is not a... A suggestion it's not something that's good for us to do it is good for us to do but it's not just something that's good for us to do it's a commandment that all men everywhere repent that's Jew that's Gentile that's everybody now there is a teaching that's going on right now that only the Jewish people need to repent because us as Gentiles we have nothing to repent from apparently uh, that we don't need repentance. Um, as Gentiles, we only need faith. Uh, but if you're a Jew, uh, you have to have the works of faith. But there's only one salvation message. The salvation message covers all of us, Jew and Gentile. The Word of God tells us that there is no differentiation between Jew and Gentile. Uh, when Jesus came and died on the cross, that separation, that division was gone. Yes, salvation came to the Jews first and then to the Greek. That's the Gentiles. That's us. All right. But we all have the same salvation message. Okay. And simply saying, without true repentance, you do not have salvation. This is what the Bible teaches. This is what the Bible has taught the entire time. The story, the message has not changed. Why do all men need to repent? What is the one thing that we all have in common? Let's look at Isaiah chapter 53, verse 6. Isaiah chapter 53, verse 6. And we, like sheep, have gone astray. Or excuse me. All we, like sheep, have all gone astray. We've all gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord hath laid on him, that's Jesus, the iniquity or the sins of us all. So because we have all, like sheep, gone astray, we have all come, so what, how does that say? We have all turned, every one of us, to our own way. Okay, so we have turned away from God's way, we've turned to, to our way. Well, what makes me happy? What makes me do this? What, wh how, what motivates me in my life? It's what I want. Me, 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 me. The selfishness. That's idolatry. All right? So that's one thing we all have in common. We have all come to ourselves, and we all serve ourselves instead of God before we come to uh, serve God before we repent. All right? So it says, We have turned every one of us to his own ways, and the Lord has laid on him, Jesus Christ. Jesus has taken on the iniquities. He has taken on all of our sins for all of us. All right. Let's look at Acts chapter 2, verse 36 to 38. Acts chapter 2, verse 36 to 38. Therefore, let all of the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made the same Jesus whom ye have crucified, both Lord and Christ. Now, when they heard this, they they, they were pricked in their hearts and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins, and ye shall receive 
the gift of the Holy Spirit. Now, pretty much through all the New Testament, this is what we see. Uh, repent, be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of our sins, and we receive the Holy Spirit. There is one instance where people were filled with the Holy Spirit and saved without baptism. Um, but it's only one time, and that was to get people's attention, uh, the apostles' attention, that uh, salvation was not just for the Jews. Because up until, it's, it's called the Gentile Day of Pentecost, uh, because Peter was preaching to them, the Spirit of God fell on them, they all started speaking in tongues, and Peter was like, wow, what has happened to them is exactly what happened to us when we were all in the upper room. They had that Pentecost experience. Now, they had not been baptized, but they had been saved by the Word of God that was being preached by Peter, and the Spirit of God came on them and, and filled them with the Holy Spirit. All right, But what brought them to this point in their life? Their hearts were pricked. How were their, their hearts were pricked? They had their toes stepped on. They, they had remorse because he had told them that they had crucified the Christ. And it's not just them as Jews, but it's all of us because we sin. That we have, because of our sin, we have crucified Christ. And if we really realize that, that's going to bring us in and prick our hearts, make us feel conviction, make us feel convicted that what we had done wrong. So they heard the word through Peter. All right, that word pricked their hearts, brought them into conviction. All right, so then. We see that. Now, according to modern-day theologians, the salvation message is just believe. That is to have faith in the mental aspect and accept Christ and you'll be saved. Because if you add anything to faith, then it is a work and we are not saved by works. Now, you're going to want to hear our next um, uh, lessons after we finish here with repentance because we're going to be doing faith and we get into faith quite deeply and I pretty much tell and show how it's not by faith alone that we are saved. We are saved by grace through faith, exactly like the Apostle Paul tells us. But uh, not to get off the story, the, the message here, uh, today's salvation message is just believe, have faith, the mental aspect of faith, accept Christ, and you will be saved. There's nothing else to add to it. It's not faith plus anything. It's just faith and faith alone. Um, but what is the true message of salvation that we hear in the Bible? One, the true plan of salvation is, one, here, we hear the Word of God. We receive the Word of God in our heart. That Word of God is a seed that's planted in us. That seed starts to grow. Then second, we repent. All right, this is what we're going over today. Then we believe or have faith, and that is that is the word for faith, metaneo, which is the change in how we think. Then confession, that the Lord Jesus Christ is our Lord and Savior, and we be baptized. This is the true salvation message that has been taught throughout the New Testament uh, that was brought to us by Jesus and the apostles. Repentance is most important in becoming a Christian, and not only important in becoming a Christian, but it's equally important in our life as Christians after we're saved. And we will be getting into that aspect of it after we finish uh, the salvation uh, messages uh, through baptism. When we get, uh, uh, we'll be finishing faith up next week, uh, confession of the Lord Jesus Christ, and then baptism, we'll be doing that um, uh, the, the week after that. We'll be doing confession and baptism. All right, so. Do we remember Simon the Magician? Simon the Magician used to practice magic. He was a practicer of the clerical, or not the clerical arts. He was a practice of, of the mystical arts. He was uh, a Houdini, so to speak, of that, of that day and age. And uh, he heard the word of God. All right, So he heard the first part. He heard the message. He heard the word. It planted a seed in him. It brought him to change the way he thought. He repented. He had faith. He was saved. He confessed the Lord Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior. He was baptized. All right? He was baptized, and then something happened. Uh, there were a group of people that uh, Philip was preaching to, and they were saved. They were baptized, but they didn't, hear, see the whole, they didn't receive the, the baptism of the Holy Spirit. So 
uh, Philip called for Peter and some of the apostles. Peter and some of the apostles came down and laid hands on them so they would receive the Holy Spirit. Because normally the Holy Spirit came upon after, after baptism. The Holy Spirit would fall on people and baptize them. Um, but it didn't happen. But when Simon saw how Peter had laid hands on people and they received the gift of the Holy Spirit, Simon said, how much do I need to pay you so that I can lay hands on people and have them receive the Holy Spirit? And Peter rejected him. And what did Peter tell him? Acts chapter 8, verses 22. And Peter says, that's Acts chapter 8, 22. Repent, therefore, of thy wickedness, and pray, God, if perhaps the thought of thy heart might be forgiven thee. For I perceive that thou art in the gall of bitterness and in the bond of iniquity. This is what Peter told Simon. So, again, Simon heard the message that he needed. He received the message that he needed to repent. It pricked his heart. It brought him into conviction. So what did Simon do? What happened with Simon's conviction and the way he changed his mind? Verse 8, 24. All right, verses 8, to chapter 8, 24, verse 24. Then answered Simon and said, Pray ye to the Lord for me, that none of these things which ye have spoken come upon me. All right, so this was, this was Simon. He, he was repenting of his ways, and he uh, was asking that they would pray for him. Uh, that he would receive the forgiveness of God, and he changed his heart, he changed his thinking, and he changed his action. So the Bible teaches us that repentance is a change of mind. Okay, you might want to write this down. It's up on the screen as well. A change of mind that produced by godly sorrow resulting in a reformation of life. This is the biblical, the complete and full definition of, of repentance all right a change of mind that produces or is produced sorry is produced by godly sorrow resulting in a reformation of life all right i'm going to go ahead and close off for now with this and we will continue this uh another day to part two of repentance um thank you for joining us uh don't forget to give us thumbs up like it um go ahead and subscribe so that you can uh, get more, be notified of when we do our next video uploads of our next uh, Bible study. All right. Thank you. God bless. And we hope to see you soon.